Um, I'm, I'm going to call um, this bit, um, this has got to be the least um, ethnically diverse uh, gender balance panel that uh, I, I, we could have put together. So we're going to call... <laughs> so this is going to be three grumpy old men having an argument um, uh, for, for, for the next period. Um, and then um, for the... Oh, okay, yeah. Thank okay. um, you. And then um, we're going to move on to get on to, to the business. So this session is really going to be quite a bit of talking at you. It's going to be a bit of talking at tables. But it is to um, describe what the OI strategic plan has set as a direction for us over the next six years. And the reason I brought these two esteemed friends and um, uh, colleagues um, to, to have a conversation is to put people back at the heart of that discussion because as Penny mentioned we're into a new area of trying to reach that bottom billion and that is an enormous challenge and so we're going to have a debate around three rural worlds to try and better explain that and is that a helpful framework for us to take um, our analysis forward on I think it is but it's to, it's to, to create that stimulation Okay, so what has the OI strategic um, plan said? The OI strategic plan and OGB's priorities within it will be very familiar to many of you. Very familiar to many of you. It talks about two change goals. It talks about, um, oh, there's got two, the same change goals out there. It's actually, um, uh, a fair and sustainable food system, change goal four, and change goal far, five is <coughs> fair share of natural resources. That will be very familiar to you. What is the content in there? But I'm going to speak a bit more about the content in the middle. The big shift in the OI strategic plan is really on the how. It is on the how. This is that role of Oxfam <coughs> and how we can make change happen. So what the strategic plan spends a lot of time talking about is leveraging change and it also highlights one really key point. We are really focusing down on trying to get change at the national level. We have a history of doing small projects or humanitarian delivery at the local level. We want to get change up to the national level. And we've done some fantastic global campaign work, and we want to see how that can better connect down to the national level. You may say that's quite familiar, but what we're really trying to set a course on is Oxfam can only create a few small models of what an inclusive and sustainable economic development can look like. We can't change that bigger bigger piece of development in the world. That is a very complex system. But it's how do we create either replicable models to challenge the current economic thinking, or how can we leverage um, and advocate for key, for key changes? So that is the, the really big, um, um, big shift in our work. And secondly, all of us should put women at the heart of what we do. And the, as Penny said, the days of income generation are gone. What we have understood is that there are complex systems that leaves people marginalised and excluded. And we've got to work across a range of systems to overcome those structural, structural barriers. So unless we are shifting how women attitudes and beliefs towards women, we're not going to see the change of role for women in the market system. Unless we deal with the ecosystem and the farm system, we're not going to see the adapt adaptation to climate change and the sustainable intensification that we've got to see um, beginning or being delivered over the next period. And as ever, we need to sh see inclusion for women and that bottom billion into jobs and wealth creation. And what underpins all of this is power. 
It is power. We will remain absolutely set on changing structurally these systems and increasing the power of those who are marginalised. But what we mean by that is it's not just about political power, which is often our default setting. It is the, it, we use the, um, the power cube to use some jargon. We look at power, the confidence of women to overcome their situation and different powers. Secondly, and with this is what we're going to spend a bit of time on this morning, we want, to, we want to be much clearer on the different futures for the segments of that bottom billion or even still the bottom two billion in poverty. What's their futures look like? So that's why the three rural worlds we feel is a good typology. It is, where can these groups get to? Now, women will appear through this picture of the three rural worlds. But I'm not going to spend much time explaining it now. This will come out of our conversations. But in simple form, what is recognised is that classical economic development is only touching the top up to 10 12% of the smallholders that get into that export World Bank model of agricultural development. We have this range of farms who have assets proximate to markets, who the, the idea behind our work is trying to reach this group to get them in. But we've got this huge divide over here, this huge rump, where we're either in humanitarian response, meeting their food security needs, or we're missing them from our work around economic development. And so a real core question at the heart of the next strategic plan is how do we, what pathways out of poverty are there for women and men who don't have the assets that the farm is not going to, they don't have the land, they don't have a big enough land size that agricultural development is going to take them out of poverty. What are those pathways for that group? And coming back to this question of power, can we get redistribution of assets, redistribution of power, so that they, they can still come into um, this world? And uh, Norrell, can, in the room. Norrell, do you want to stand up? This is Norrell from Bangladesh. I quote, thank, you need to talk to this man about this story, but I quote this story all the time. Thanks, Norrell. Um, it is, you need to speak to him, because I've only learnt it from him. There's a fantastic piece of work going on in Bangladesh where they have integrated their GEM program with a social protection program. And in that social protection program, they're getting asset transfers to vulnerable women. And the idea was about food security. But by running a GEM program, and they got some investment from a chili processing factory, we were seeing transformation from this part of the world. These women with no assets, no land, actually move right up and be working in our economic development program. Now that is one pathway, but this is a really nutty question. It's a really tough question, and let's not be simplistic about it. We're gonna, we don't know the answer. There is not one answer, but we don't know many answers at the moment. And a lot of it for Oxfam is that structural divide between our humanitarian development teams. But I'm just gonna quickly say, I'm not gonna, uh, throw up the objectives and the points, but I'm going to give what I think four clear pictures, sorry, five clear pictures of what the strategic plan says on content. We continue to support and invest in smallholders and women. And we have this question about how we can get different one of those rural worlds into that agricultural development, but we should not assume that is the right future for them. We have multiple exa examples sitting around the room. I'm not going to um, tell you, um, you will know as much as me about how to deliver this. But it's just a reminder, in 2004 in the strategic plan, we talked about power in markets, and we really were on enterprise development and income generation. In 2009, we said it's not good enough to do gender mainstreaming, and the risks increasing on agriculture are so high, we really need to put risk and women central in our work. And so that was the shift in 2009. 
And the, sh the shift now is coming back to that, that question of how can we really leverage change at the national level? Maintaining our work on power in markets, maintaining our work on adaptation, maintaining putting women's economic leadership at the very centre. And the next few days, you will be sharing good practice on how to do that. That is getting good practice shared across the Confederation in countries on how to do that. Secondly, we moved from producers being price takers to hopefully moving towards being price makers. And what I mean by that is if you talk to government, they are concerned about will they have enough food to feed their population. If you talk to the private sector around the food system, they're saying, where are we going to get our supplies from? <clears throat> We've got resource scarcity. You've got Kate Rayworth's fantastic donut economics, which it, for those who are familiar with that, it is about there will be environmental limits to what we can produce. And when that occurs, those with power and wealth try and secure their base. And so we will continue, again quite familiar, to defend the rights of those marginalised communities to their assets. It's been a narrative through the GROW campaign primarily about land, but we're seeing, I was at the EJ RENA meeting, which is all of the regional representatives coming to design the, the next phase spike of the GROW campaign, which will be food and climate justice, there was a massive conversation and pushback coming from the regions and countries. It was fantastic around water and saying that's going to be a really uh, binding um, discussion. And there was a real pushback from the regions to get water into that. So we will have our behind the back brands work. Erin, do you want to stand up? Erin, she's Mr. Behind the Brands. He's done the index. You want to know about it? Talk to him. I haven't got a clue. Um, and our GROW campaign from 2014 will be talking about food and climate justice. More from a long-term development perspective, this question of governance, which, move, which sits over the household system, the, 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 the ecosystem, and the market system, will really sit over defending the rights to natural resources. So this question of how can we get effective governance, the voices of women, the voices of our communities in. We've got some great examples. I love the example from Novib in Indonesia on the work around palm oil and securing the rights to land there and the real challenges. We've got Politic in Guatemala. And this is where we're going to see a, a much more a combination of our campaign work and our long-term development work in an ideal world. We'll be coming more from a governance point of view. The campaigners will be coming more from a defend and attack um, those vested interests doing the wrong thing. So on terms of new content, this is probably the new content story for the OISP. It's been there. Whether you called it DRR, whether you called it adaptation to climate change, that should be very familiar. And there's many people in the room um, who've been doing that work. But we've really put this central question in. How do we deliver the outcome of resilience? If any of you, you get buzzwords in Oxfam, and no doubt Penny will be seeing loads of project proposals with resilience written all over them. She's not going to be convinced, are you, Penny? She's really not going to be convinced by that term. Resilience is about an outcome. I don't think we're going to be doing much resilience programming. It's about creating resilience as an outcome. And what will sit, sit at the heart of it is this mix of adaptation, social protection, and risk reduction. There's some fantastic work going on in Intamon called the COSME um, methodology, where they're building around food reserves and social protection systems at national level to, to deliver social protection, but also deliver um, livelihoods. We've got the ACRA program, our, our ACRA program, where we're doing research to, to influence national policy. And we've got Oxfam's America 4R program, the four, four R's of resilience. Um, there are other people in the room who can speak better to that than I. I just can't spot any of you at the moment. Um, 
But we've really got a, a really central question there, and it is how to sustainably intensify food production. And some people don't like this word, sustainably intensify. Fine, we've just got to work out how to grow more food with less. If you think the big chemical companies have captured that word, fine. But we can't have an assumption of what form of production that will be. And I hear a lot of people saying, it's all about agroecology. Yep, that could be a really good pathway, but that's a type of production. We've got to work out what form of production that looks like, and all the evidence is pointing to there will be different, different solutions in different parts of the world. Some heavily technology-based, some heavily uh, knowledge and community-based. But what we must see is a complete shift of knowledge transfer to that bottom two billion, one billion. And again, we, we come back to this question of how do we move this rump of the population in, in the rural world that really have very few options? And, and another part of the Bangladesh problem, so, uh, Bangladesh problem, program, um, and Norrell again can hopefully talk about that, is that tr they, are, they are getting the rights, the identification of people in rural populations clear so that they can migrate to the urban world. And that will be one key pathway, this connection between rural and urban. And many of the, many of the solutions that we'll be finding on employment and livelihoods will be found in urban economic centres. And to segue into that, We've got a, we've said it for the last two strategic plans. Let's innovate around urban. And we've bluntly done very little. I'm smiling at some of our hecker colleagues, colleagues who are smiling back at me. And no doubt many of you may be in this debate. I'm now seeing a shift to probably only about 10 focus countries, but there is now a shift of determination to really get on and do that work. It will, be, it will look very different in very different places, but we will have, this is a picture of the people we will be targeting. 72% of the African urbanized population live in slums. We've got to be looking at that population um, about what are, uh, what, what are the solutions. Our Feed in the Cities work, Colombia. Is anyone from Colombia here? Colombia, stand up. Um, if you want to hear about the Colombian program, it's a fantastic program where we've looked at this, uh, th this connection. But one thing that I think is brilliant about the Colombia program is coming back to this idea of systemic change and leveraging change. They spotted a transformational moment. They spotted the Bogota government making the, the grand food security plan for Bogota. And it was all about meeting the food security needs of 100,000 more migrants coming in from the conflict, coming into in, to Bogota. What the Colombia team did is they turned it into a conversation about rural-urban. They said, that food solution can be delivered by peri-urban um, food producers. And they look like they are women, primarily, and they, they are primarily small producers. A piece of brilliance of spotting that moment, seizing it, and changing it. So we will need to do more around around feeding the cities, and we will find municipal governments <coughs> will want this conversation on food security. How can we connect to that? But I think we're going to see a shift from our traditional market production-based solutions to much more the informal econo economy. And I'm going to smile at Thalia at this point, because we've done some research that I can lend sh show to any people stepping into urban that actually it's not going to be so much about crops and product sectors. It's going to be much more about informal employment. We need to take our same systems approach, but it's going to be those, those markets and labour markets. Informal labour markets are going to be really key. So that's going to look like, um, that could be very large sectors in Bangladesh. They're looking at the factory sector, and we've seen the, the tragedy that has come in that world recently. And then in, in other areas, they're looking at uh, domestic work, women in domestic work. 
And we'll be looking at um, wash, water and sanitation and, 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 he and services around slum populations and is there employment generation there. But so I'm really clear what we are not going to do, and it was a debate, and again, you can speak to Steve Jennings. Steve, do you want to put your hand up about the debates that we had in the EJ change goal? I'll deny everything. <laughs> we had a debate about, is this a, are we going to go back and look at um, wage, agricultural wage workers? And we decided we weren't. But we will be looking at informal urban markets. We do think, in, sorry, informal, informal labour markets in urban areas. But that's the step up work. So that is a very, very quick overview of the OI strategic plan focused on economic justice, very much with a flavour of kind of OGB priorities, but very much a flavour of coming from this market-based livelihoods, GM, EDP, all in. Any clarification questions before I, I move on to the much more intelligent and, and engaging people than myself? Um, Bill and Stephen Bill. Any clarification questions? And if you're in Oxfam House, you can't ask one. I'm around. It's only people from the regions. Any clarification questions before we move on? Anything you want to know? Or was I crystal clear? In silence will be consent, so we will move on. Right, so that's the OA strategic plan. So we're now going to move into a patch, and I'll let these two esteemed um, grumpy old men introduce themselves. <laughs> and um, they're going to give two 15-minute views on the three rural worlds. And how helpful is this to look at those, really those two fundamental questions? What is the long-term future for those populations that are stuck? What does market-based livelihoods mean for the three rural worlds, in particular those that are stuck? And Bill's going to look at more markets to three rural worlds. And Steve's going to look at, give us much more trends and analysis and numbers, but also ask that sustainable intensification, what does it mean for food security for three rural worlds? Does it help us analyse it and come up with different solutions? So I'll hand over to my two beautiful colleagues. Okay, good morning. Whilst uh, we're getting the PowerPoint up, I'm Steve Wiggins. I'm a research fellow from the Overseas Development Institute in, in London. I'm an agricultural economist um, with quite a few years' experience, mainly in Africa and Latin America, and I've spent my life on agricultural and rural development. Okay, uh, it's supposed to be 15 minutes. There's about 11 slides in here. Uh, just having a quick look at some of those slides, I can see that some of them need about 25 minutes. So we're going to zoom through some of this, but basically what I want to cover here is say a few words about smallholder differences. Um, hang on, hang on. I'm a control freak and somebody's pressing the button too loud. Too loud. Just take the microphone away. Take the microphone away. Um, I'm going to talk about differences, I'm going to talk about transitions, and I'm going to talk about policy. Okay, first, first big point, smallholder farmers are different. Now, we all kind of know this stuff. <laughs> Drop the microphone completely. Yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's okay. Can you do that? <laughs> I spent 19 years in universities, you know, with semi-deaf students in huge rooms, <laughs> lousy, lousy acoustics. Okay, look, we all know that rural, rural incomes can be remarkably different, but it's only when you get to survey data that you realise how different it is. This stuff is rural struck by Bruno Losch when he was working with the, the World Bank. Those are distributions of incomes in six countries. Now, we could spend a lovely 10 minutes going through this, but all I want you to see on this is that in 
I didn't do anything. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, really. <laughs> okay. I wonder, it must have a timing pattern name to it. Okay, look, all I want you to see in this is that in most of these cases, we've got a tremendous range of, of, of incomes. There's an awful lot of people piled up in the low income bit, but the distribution is pretty tremendous. And if we have more time, we discuss what's going on here in Mexico, which is rather interesting. Now, when we, for those of you who are economists and know what Gini coefficients are, I can tell you that you can hardly ever do village surveys and end up with a Gini coefficient of less than 50%. Uh, and 50% is high. I used to think the big income differences were between rich people in cities and poor people in rural areas. Not when you do village, village level surveys. There's an awful lot of differentiation. Okay, we're going to whiz through these slides because Bill's going to do them, David's already done them. Here are three ways of differentiating. Um, this is the schema called Rural Worlds, published by OEC DAC, <laughs> created by, by Bill on original ideas from Mexico and Canada. And that says our first rural world is full of large-scale commercial farmers. There aren't many of those. Then we've got a second rural world, which is smallholder farmers with reasonable access to assets, reasonable access to markets and so on, maybe hiring in labor, probably commercialized. Then we've got a really big bunch of people for whom the word that they put in there is survival, it's food first, it's about getting through every day. And then behind that, you can add a couple of other rural worlds. Uh, Bill didn't like this, but OECD DAC added it on. Rural world four, the landless, and rural world five, the chronically poor, and probably the non-working poor as well. That's one schema. Uh, Andrew Dorwood and colleagues at uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, uh, they have a three-way split where they talk about potentially full-time commercial smallholder farmers. Then there's a diversified smallholders, and I'll tell you what the rent fee is in a few minutes. It's the rural non-farm economy. Um, and they talk about marginalized farmers for whom the main goal in life is hanging in. Here is another way of looking at it, which I really rather like. This is Rimis which is the Latin America Rural Development Center based down in Santiago. And when they were looking in Latin America, they said, we reckon it looks a bit like this. We've got a dimension which is access to assets. How much land have you got? How much capital? How much labor? And so on. And what's your environment like? Uh, and this is environment in terms of access to market and quality of natural resources. Yeah? And so that gives us, you know, two dimensions here. And what they say is, we've got a bunch of people in the Latin American countryside who are in this lucky quadrant up here. They've got assets, they've got access to market, they've got decent rainfall, irrigation, decent soil, and so on. This lot got good chances in life. We've got another bunch here who are marginalized. Everything is bad for them. A uh, few assets, and they're in the middle of nowhere, and it's not much good land in any case. But then you've got a messy middle, yeah? Anytime you come up with these 2 v 2 matrices, of course, they're always wildly deceptive, because most people are usually somewhere in that bit there. So that ABC splodge, we're going to come back to that, and that's, that's going to be a rather important way of looking at things. Now look, I want to talk a bit about transitions. We're going to come back to this. I don't, I know it looks like we're losing the thread here. Um, but let's talk a bit about transitions and point out this. Most small farmers today are not going to be small farmers in 50 years' time. Yeah, those households will not be full-time small farms. The moment you say this, of course, everybody says, people start screaming at you because they get the wrong end of the stick. Now look, let's look at some rural choices. What are these transitions about? 
They're all about jobs. And the point is, the majority of people in the countryside will probably be getting most of their incomes, not from farming, but from the rural non-farm economy, from those off-farm jobs, in local rural centres, uh, possibly off the farm itself, and so on. And some, of course, are going to migrate to the towns and the cities. That's what transitions look like. But when we look at transitions, we need to remind ourselves that they come in at least two varieties. One is called brutal, the other is called gentle. What does a brutal transition look like? It looks like that. That's Scotland in the 18th century, yeah? The highland clearances, rapacious landlords who reneged on their traditional obligations to their people, put sheep there instead of people, shipped them off to the shores to die, um, and there's an abandoned cottage left in the, in the population, absent uh, areas of Scotland. If you go up to the top left-hand corner of Scotland, and you should do if you get the chance, most beautiful countryside in the world, there's absolutely nothing left. There's nobody there. The population density is sensationally low by European standards. That's a brutal transition. Get them off the land, yeah? Get profit in there as quickly as possible. And it's a real pity that if you speak the English language, you tend to look at British experiences when you look at history. And the British experiences were rather unusual and some of the most brutal of the lot. The enclosures in England and above all the clearances that we saw in Scotland and similar processes of course in Ireland accelerated by the famine of the 1840s. Here's an alternative. France. And of course because it's France we never see this as English people. France had a peasantry and still has a peasantry. The French peasantry was guaranteed its rights to land by the revolution, and it slowly moved out. And these are wonderful images of pe pe peasant heroism, uh, which we don't have in England. We don't have those images. But basically, what you see in France is a long, slow transition to urbanization. It's people slowly getting jobs off the land where their original peasant holdings become part-time farming, eventually weekend farming, eventually hobby farming, and the gradual relinquishment of the attachment to the agrarian way of life in a gentle and a much more benign transition than anything that happened in the UK and Ireland. Okay, look, here's one of the big ones. Now, you've actually already seen this because David's used it. These are putting some numbers on, these, on who's in what rural world, yeah? And these are numbers dis from data provided by RIMISP in Latin America, and it's averaging out 12 Latin American countries. Now, the really important thing here is these are large-scale commercial farms, about 3% of holdings. 9% are those Class A farms. Remember the ones with the really favorable environment. So we've got about 12% who are in good conditions. That messy middle, that B category of farmers, neither one thing nor the other, 20%. And then we've got 43% of marginalized farms. And by the calculations we made, about a quarter of the households are landless. Now the big point is this, is leave it to the market, and you'd be amazed what happens if you leave it to the market, leave it to the market, the only ones who are going to get a big kick on are this lot here. 3% plus 9% equals 12%, 88% are out of it, yeah? That's 1 to 7. What we're betting on there for our agricultural development is that the development of one in every seven households can somehow generate multipliers 
to the other seven households. That's probably not going to work. And okay, you say it's not multipliers rurally for those people, a whole bunch of them have moved off to the city. That's a lot of people hitting the city very quickly. Will the urban economy generate jobs that quickly? Probably not. It's not a good bet. If we can bring these 20% in, we're at 32 plays 68, one to two. Have we got a chance of creating multipliers rurally and in urban areas on the scale of one to two? I reckon we have, yeah? So that's my um, passionate particular position on this. We've got to bring these guys in, yeah? These guys, it's going to be off the land, yeah? It's going to be off the land. As full-time commercial farmers. Right. Okay. Now let me show you how this might play out in policy terms. Who needs what? This is the last slide, but it takes 25 minutes. <laughs> I haven't worked out how to use PowerPoint, but you don't get the whole damn thing at one go. But if we want to finish in 15 minutes, maybe I stop right now. But look, let me tell you what we're doing here. These are our classes of farmers, yeah? This lot are the lot who can, can move ahead. It's the class A farmers. Here are our class B farmers who have half a chance of becoming full-time, small-scale farmers in the future. Here's our marginalized farmers who can step out into the rural non-farm economy and so on. And here is actually a group of people who are chronically poor, probably marginalized by age, disability, illness, you name it, yeah? And here's some policy options. And very, very simply, what this graph says is fundamental things for agriculture and rural development. Everybody needs a rural investment climate, a stable macroeconomy, peace and stability, some fundamental <coughs> institutions like recognized land rights. Everybody needs those, so that's why that's in green. And if I'd thought about this a bit more, that would be a deeper green than this because these fundamentals here matter a hell of a lot more for the very poor than they do for the better off people down this end of the spectrum. Here are rural public goods. That's roads and power lines. That's education, water and health. And it's the knowledge goods of agricultural research and extension. Rural public goods. Everybody needs that, and this lot need it even more than this lot, because this lot have half a chance, of course, of replacing public action by private action. Poor people never do. A functioning state is absolutely critical in this. <coughs> then here's the really difficult bit. All this lot, by the way, is really, really easy. Yeah? It's not rocket science. This one is really, really difficult, correcting market failures. What I mean by that, how many small farmers you've ever seen who've got formal financial services, who've got proper access to inputs, technical assistance, and so on? Rural markets typically have many failings in them. How do we remedy that? This lot here, the famous private sector approach, it'll work, but only for Group A, yeah? For the rest, is it private action, is it state actions, do we do it by state command, do we do it by institutional innovations? Bill, I think, is going to lead us through this row here. Uh, and if he isn't, if he is, well, he is, he's, he's, he's nodding. And just to, just to complete this so we can get out of here, um, transfers of investment capital and working capital Red zone for the first two lot. Don't do it. Please, please never recommend it. It wastes huge amounts of money. This one will cost us a lot here. That doesn't cost us. This costs us money. So we can't give people transfers of capital and assets. Do it and your budget's gone. Try looking at the Zambian Ministry of Agriculture budget. It all goes on fertilizer subsidies to the best off farmers. Hopeless. Probably a brilliant way to get votes, but who cares? 
uh, from an economic point of view, it makes no sense. Perhaps for the chronically poor down this end, possibly for these guys here. And then last, transfers to consumers, pure social protection, not needed for this lot, but obviously for the chronically poor. Quick guide to policy. Main thing that's going on in here, two things that you, I want you to take away from this. One is options, 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 yeah? Different people, we need lots of different options, yeah? Create the options and then let people work out how to create their livelihoods. There is huge ingenuity uh, down there, so let's create the options. And second point is you will hear so much about the private sector, and there's nothing wrong with the private sector, but a state that works to provide those fundamentals, if we haven't got that, then people down in these groups here don't have much of a chance. Okay. Um, I would like to hold any clarification questions unless anyone has something absolutely burning. I know we're working in second and often third language. Was there anything burning that wasn't clear there? But we are going to, at the end of Bill's session, turn you over to have an internal discussion at your tables on what this means, and we'll have time for some, some questions. So if there's no real clarification questions, I'm going to hand on to my other esteemed colleague. Um, you will see a Oxfam briefing paper coming out called Tipping the Balance, and that was joint work with IAD and, and Bill. Fantastic piece. Sorry. So I'll hand over to Bill and let him introduce himself. And he's a much quieter speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm a big fan of Oxfam, and I, I'm a big fan of the fact that you are a, a learning organization as well as an implementing organization. And I really value the way that you do this kind of meeting to challenge where you're going. Uh, and I also appreciate the diversity of the Oxfam family. I, I spent Friday evening in a debate at or, um, uh, Oxfam Werner Winkles in uh, Brussels with uh, Olivier de Schutter and uh, uh, some other people on corporate concentration. So I'm, I'm fresh from that <coughs> debate, um, which has a, a whole different flavor. But it, 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 it's a very, very, uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of the way that you go about things. And I'm, I'm gonna structure this presentation uh, building on, on this great uh, um, platform that, that Steve has created, talking about how rural differentiation affects attitude to risk and how that um, affects through, through producers' own agency the way that markets are chosen and what that means for institutions that work for the majority rather than the minority of people in the real world. <coughs> and I was here in Oxford, I don't know how many bloody years, how many years ago it was, I, to, talking of something similar. Um, I'm, I'm older, but hopefully not, not grumpier <coughs> than then. And in this 2002 publication from IID, I, I pointed to the fact that a lot of the policies that are designed uh, for rural development and smallholder uh, development are blind to this differentiation in the countryside. Whether it's a sectoral program or a territorial program, it treats small-scale producers as a single entity rather than as a highly differentiated uh, sector. But if we want to be serious about our objectives of food security, climate uh, resilience, <coughs> and um, natural resource management, we've got to understand that, that differentiation much better. But the problem is that that has been very much replicated in the world of inclusive business and making markets work for the poor, in that the smallholder is a smallholder, often uh, you know, an undifferentiated animal. Uh, but if you look up closely, of course, 
when you're doing uh, market-based interventions, you've got to treat this as a very differentiated uh, body. By the way, this is called growing business for smallholders, but these are, these are probably wage laborers here. You know, it's an agency picture, and, and we've done just the same thing ourselves. And another thing I've done myself is to use uh, an undifferentiated recipe for smallholders in markets, where if you get if you get uh, happy buyers, willing buyers, if you get capacity development in smallholder populations, and you have an enabling environment, that you hit a sweet spot for inclusive business. But <clears throat> that's that's not really um, that's not necessarily true, because rural worlds too, especially have a much different uh, risk profile than rural world one. But if you're in a potentially rewarding market, those high risks of price uncertainty, the uncertainty of having a buyer, uh, frequent periods of, 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 of tight cash flow variations in yields, which are magnified by climate change, and the need to secure your food supply in, as a household you're in a really uh, uh, tricky situation if you're being asked to commercialize and, uh, and get into um, value chains. And uh, of course, the high transport costs, the, the, the need for immediate cash, and the lack of storage means that you're, if you're in cereal production, for instance, you're, you're very unlikely to use hedging strategies despite what the World Bank uh, tells you you should be doing. So for rural world too, this is the this is the majority and it's the reality. Uh, we're doing some work with SNB in Uganda, uh, oil seeds at the moment. And if you ask farmers what their what their factors, um, what the most risky things are for them in growing oil seeds for the market, I was I was completely astonished by this. By the way, the top was low or volatile market prices at the time of sale. And there's, a, there's another uh, risk-oriented um, thing that come, also came up very high, the risk of no market. This is a relatively thin market. And um, there's a high risk that you've invested a lot in seeds and you've diverted land from food production, but there's no buyer. Also, relative to gender, there, uh, especially coming uh, from women, is this thing about high requirements for labor. It's not necessarily land that's a constraint, but labor. And the risk of food insecurity from allocating land to cash crops rather than food crops. So this is, this is the situation uh, of, of a large number of your uh, sort of constituents. And um, Often in market-based development, you say, well, let's make the market more reliable. Let's organize farmers in the market so that they can aggregate and store production uh, and, and build capacity to get that yield variability sorted out. But the other way is to follow farmers to where they are rather than to where we want them to be. And uh, we've done some work with, with PIVOS recently over the last few years come up with this book on smallholder agency in the globalized market. And that, sh that really gave me the, the feeling that it's not, we shouldn't be looking so much here to understand the truth. We should be looking more at here. Because there are a lot of forces that are pushing in this direction. There are more traders in the countryside often than there used to be. The incentive to produce, to, to form an organization uh, and, and, and collaborate around uh, market, marketing are actually, is actually declining when there are more traders willing to buy at the farm gate. Those a information asymmetries that used to be one of the main calling cards of producer organizations are declining in the, in the era of mobile phones and stronger rural urban connections. These informal or semi-formal national and, and regional markets are highly dynamic thanks to urbanization uh, and economic growth. Producer organizations continue to suffer from weaknesses. They are, and the successful ones are very suspicious of the poorest farmers. And women also, as you know, often have special problems to get into producer organizations. 
and are more reliant on the informal sector. And then those, those agribusiness who we look for, look to for, for inclusive business, are struggling to work with smallholders because of the drive for food safety and integrity, which means that the trend actually seems to be towards taking production in-house rather than doing the inclusive business stuff. So it's this part, this story, that we need to be looking at from a, from a policy uh, and, and private sector perspective. The, the rural, the informal economy is huge, and amazingly enough, it's growing. It's growing in most countries, and uh, that it's difficult to conceptualize agriculture from an informal lens, but that's certainly part of the story. And if you consider that still 4% of India's huge retail market is in the modern sector, and the rest of it is, is, uh, is in, in, a, in, in sort of informal and small-scale sector, those are the sort of numbers that we have to, to, to respond to. If you look at milk sales in, uh, in East Africa, you can see that usually uh, above 90% of, of milk sales are informal rather than formal processed. Um, if you look at trade, uh, regional trade, there are huge volumes of informal exports and imports despite uh, regional trade uh, uh, and common market agreements between those countries. The transaction costs are, are mean that it's still more logical to trade informally. And uh, as I mentioned, this push for vertical integration is, is, is big. And the new uh, footprint report that uh, ASDA, IPL, Walmart uh, has done with, with, with Oxfam um, mean that uh, it shows that the number of uh, small-scale producers in the green bean sector uh, is actually declining. One of the famous making a smallholder uh, uh, market access um, stories. So what we're calling for um, is a differentiated policy. And I've got to, I've got to finish really fast, so I'm going to have to trot through this. So we've got real world two. We've got to understand informality, unorganized producers, and here the emphasis must be on raising the performance of the market in general for the majority, rather than relying only on vertical chain-based interventions. And for rural world three, labor market uh, must be a priority, and I, I do question your decision not to look at uh, wage labor from, a, from, a, from a, an agricultural and rural perspective. So whether you, whether you choose a vertical chain-based uh, intervention or a more horizontal sector-wide intervention, I think is a really important area for Oxfam to consider. If we're gonna look at market institutions for the majority rather than minority, We've got to look at, uh, at, at institutional uh, innovations that raise the performance of, of the sector. Raising the performance of the sector as a whole in terms of quality, share of benefits, remote areas, women, and, uh, and rural world too, and, um, rather than uh, vertical interventions. And if just before I, I finish, let's, I wanna show you some numbers of how this might look in terms of share of benefit. If you look at one of these horizontal interventions, the Kenya, um, Kenya Tea Development Agency, and you should look at the share that farmers have of the, of the, of the value of made tea. Uh, the Kenyan system, with all its faults, which we must acknowledge, but through collective ownership, training and access to inputs, quality and pricing structures, you end up, uh, according to these calculations, with 75% of the share of, of made tea uh, retained by farmers compared with 25 to 27% in areas that don't have these sorts of horizontal market institutions. This is an amazing uh, uh, 
air at uh, numbers. And I really, this is but very poorly researched. And if you look at some other sort of institutions, such as the Coco Bar in Ghana, the FNC, <coughs> the, the, the Coffee in Colombia, the, um, the Grain Exchange uh, in, in Ethiopia, of course, different sectors, different uh, um, approaches to the world market. But there's, there's evidence that we need to look at these, uh, these sort of market institutions again and not just talk about um, uh, uh, value chain approaches, but look at what can raise the performance of, of, of the whole sector. I, 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 re I do hope that uh, Oxfam can partner with um, research organizations to, to do more of this sort of thing. Okay, I think that's, uh, that's it. I should acknowledge there's problems with these approaches as the Colombian situation is only too familiar with, with the recent strike. Uh, it's not all a success story, especially if, you're, if your exchange rate is, is strong. Uh, just to finish up, it's not just about those sort of institutions. We need to be looking at the diversity of market outlets, cartel busting and competition policy, these old families that hang on to uh, um, uh, the, uh, especially grain markets, inclusive modernization of wholesale and retail, and uh, with their, their, their approaches to market preferences, there's, there's still that old but important area that Oxfam used to be very active in around trade policy and stepwise opening up of small order dominated uh, areas. Uh, to, to, to trade liberalization uh, is against uh, competition from low cost inputs, strengthened uh, policies for strengthened organization and market power, and adapted standards, all of which are talked about in that uh, tipping the balance report. Okay, that's it. And um, I'm, I'm sorry we've been rather uh, talking at you, but uh, I hope some of this is good for thought. Thank you very much. So now time for you to talk amongst yourselves. So do you want to take, I, I would say get into kind of, at your tables, just at your tables, form up into what's a, a comfortable group to talk in, twos, threes, or your whole table. And we've got one, we've got one question for you. What is the implications of uh, what you've heard this morning for our market-based livelihoods work. What, what are the implications? So we've had a quick run through of the strategy. We've had a, a, a further explanation of this uh, three rural worlds and, and um, uh, the typology uh, that that means. And then what the market and the three rural worlds, some implications, particularly policy implications around market institutions. So just take, Ten, 10 minutes to have that conversation at your table between yourselves. What do you think the implications of this are? And then we'll come back into plenary and you can either ask, ask questions or make comments. Thank you. Hi. Um, do I have to yeah, could you say your name? Hi, I'm um, Denise from Thailand, uh, Bangkok. Um, just going... I have, we, we have some discussion, that not enough time, but going back all the way to like your uh, early on discussion, because I'm coming from Thailand, right? And we are looking at all these cases from different countries. Um, and you mentioned like what, what would be the role of, of this implication to real income countries, mm. of which we are, Thailand is entering like an early stage of that kind of country, although we have gigantic, um, you know, like the really bad Gini kind of coefficient situation, um, but what, what would that mean, you know, in terms of this multiple world, rural world, and, and uh, you know, you mentioned a lot about this policy that, you know, transfer of, of, uh, of different things that would not work, um, working capital and so on, and Thailand is now have a populist government and it's getting along this kind of policy, so what, what would this be an implication, I'm not sure. So implications of that national policy, uh, 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 but <coughs> maybe broader implications of middle income based on every yeah. discussion yeah. you had. Yeah. Excellent. 
Yeah. Um, any other, before we um, yeah. attempt to try and summarize or respond, any other comments or questions? Joe Zaremba. Joe Zaremba, from Hacker. A <laughs> um, couple of disconnects which came up in our conversation which might pose some interesting questions. One is between um, what the donors want and what we want, huge issue always. <laughs> and another disconnect is between the rural world three and below and what Steve was talking about investing in rural worlds two and one. Um, we have a humanitarian mandate, and what we do in rural world three and four is very relevant for Oxfam, and how does that influence what happens in rural worlds two and one? So it's not just the way it you know, kind of affects back down into rural world three, but also how do we actually connect back up again? Yeah. Brilliant, thanks, Jack. Um, should we take um, one more comment or questions, and then we'll... We'll see what we'll come up with. Uh, I think. Heinz or. Okay. Hi, this is Heinz from Pakistan. I just want to throw a sort of comment. Like a lot of these presentations showed a lot of focus on the urbanization. So, why are we not so much focusing on you know, giving these facilities to the rural area, you know, shifting these kind of services over there and making markets over there? Thank you. Great question. And one more, maybe? You choose. Um, I, I think it was Norrell next, and then we'll go Alan, hand at the back, and here, but we'll try and give a quick response. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Norrell. Uh, I'm working for Oxfam Bangladesh. Uh, I participated in last global uh, workshops in uh, Ethiopia that focus on uh, women leadership. And I found uh, the very good research work and uh, very, uh, from uh, IIT. And uh, today also uh, uh, I found a very good research and a very good presentation from them. But my question is that they focus on Africa regions. So, so do they have any uh, research work in Asia or South, South Asia? And do they have any plan to work in Asia and South Asia? Great. Thanks. Okay, Bill, Steve, there was policy implications, the time in question, and research in South Asia. I'll try and take donor priorities and rural world connection to humanitarian. <laughs> right, okay, um, terrific questions. I'm chuckling because uh, Sunit's question was a 45 minute answer to that, at least, yeah? There's a Southeast Asia, yeah? So, pity we haven't got David Hanley in the room. Um, who's been writing up the political economy history of, of Southeast Asia. Peter Timmer, who is another very well-known agricultural economist, wrote an article about four or five years ago where he said, here are the lessons from Indonesia. And they are lessons for the rest of the world, but they are really important lessons for Indonesians. Yes? Uh, and you might write a little essay on Thailand right now that says, lessons for Thailand from Thailand, yes. Because Thailand, Thai, I mean, Thailand's rural transformation has been absolutely extraordinary, yeah? You have a country that in the, in, in, in the early 1960s, from what I've been reading, which is largely agrarian, it isn't industrialized, it exports rice and tea, yeah? And it goes for a big bet on industrialization. And it more or less neglects its agriculture and gets away with it. I'm not quite sure how they pull this one off. Because 20 years later, you have a thriving industrial sector. You have a particularly thriving rural non-farm economy. You have this export powerhouse of, of agriculture. A, a tropical equivalent of New Zealand, and you have people not being expelled from the land, but slowly moving away from traditional farming on the land towards a few cash crops, but also the work in the rural factory and so on. It, it's an extraordinary story. But now, of course, we have the rice policy, and Thailand is doing a fantastic job on behalf of the rest of the world. 12 million tons of rice stockpile at taxpayers' expense. See, I, we're, we're gonna have to- uh, Sorry, sorry. <laughs> it, it was 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> the lecturer in him. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me just answer the other two questions. But, the, you know, all I would say in conclusion is do learn your own lessons and be aware that you can go from one story to another rather quickly. Um, yeah, okay. Really great, Steve. Yeah. Humanitarian world, uh, there's a huge literature on how do we use social protection and also integrate it with economic growth strategies, yeah? Um, huge literature on that. Um, so we, 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 we need to dig that out. Urbanization, good thing. Uh, what are the stories about Asia and South Asia? I'd started to answer that, 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 that question in, in the comments to Sunni. Thank you. Thanks for the questions, and I'm sorry to have eaten up some of your discussion time. Um, the, the question about emerging economies slash middle income countries and the, and the question about urban are, are closely linked. What we have in, in this importance of informal markets are that these informal markets are the main link between small scale producers in the countryside and low income com uh, consumers in, in, in the urban region. And for both, the policy environment is super important around um, keeping this diversity of, of, uh, of outlets and chains, wholesale, small-scale retail, rather than uh, uh, assuming full-scale uh, consolidation and modernization of the market. Because we've got to have one more generation of good at least one more generation of good livelihoods in the countryside to deal with this new uh, uh, cadre of youth coming in to, to, to rural uh, employment. It's really important uh, that, that, we, that, that the majority of rural worlds two and three are, are in emerging economies, not in Africa. <coughs> and I think it's just as interested in those countries as they are in in, in the ones where, as you said, the donors are, are, are focused on in sub-Saharan Africa. So this, this thing about inclusive formalization, dealing with uh, um, the, the, the competitiveness uh, of, of the traditional chains must be a focus for Oxfam around um, uh, uh, standards, around um, uh, dealing with cartels, and opening up competition, and um, in modernizing uh, the, the the wholesale sector. Without that, I think we we are we are leaving it all to the uh, the metros and Tesco's and and, and uh, WalMarts of the world, and then we're going to be in real trouble as far as cleaning up behind modernization, doing a few fancy projects around inclusive business. But, but losing the main chunk of the market, uh, w which is where low-income consumers and small-scale producers are and depend on. Thank you. There was, a, uh, there was Alan, there was a hand up here, and there was a hand up at the very back. It's also the humanitarian question. And uh, I mean, just to say on that humanitarian question, it's, it's, it's a fantastic <coughs> question, Joe. The resilience agenda in Oxfam, I think, is going to drive that organisationally closer and I think it's the it is the one of the key questions to take away how do we close that gap and how do we move to a longer term vision around those communities that we tended to respond to humanitarian uh, penny just just to add one sentence on that I think um, uh, we can go actually further than that Joe and say that on the social protection that, that social protection fund is really gaining a lot of traction within the organization and simple things like the fact that, uh, you know, do we program, as we do in some countries, but do we program in the most vulnerable areas on the long-term agenda? Uh, you know, not everywhere, actually. So there's all kinds of internal things I think need to change in order to respond to that. But certainly I've noticed that the appetite for that on those working on the humanitarian issues, I'm coming hot foot from the humanitarian workshop uh, that finished on Friday, the appetite for that is very, is very strong. Thanks, Penny. Right, the next three questions for the business and finance advisor. I just wanted to reflect some of the discussion which we had on our table where our colleague from Nigeria was talking about the fact that uh, women smallholders are the majority of smallholders in Nigeria. 
but their uh, access to land and inputs and information is highly restricted. And I didn't see in the list of um, where we had the, the policy um, areas, I didn't actually see uh, any, any mention of uh, women's rights in, um, in, in that list where we had, we started off with the, um, the macroeconomic environment. And I think the political environment uh, is, is very important. And what I was trying to put together, which we didn't discuss, but I think it's the natural uh, link, is what is the link between women's rights as access to the key agricultural inputs and the increase in food production. Because if you can, it seems to me that... In, in, ignore that, it's a, it's a practice. No, panic. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think if you could... It's going to go off four times, I'm afraid. <laughs> OK, well, I'll be quick. Quick, quicker. <laughs> if you can make that link, it strikes me that you have a, a stronger political <laughs> argument to make. Mara, and then there's a hand up around there. I don't think that more needs being said, but that is an Oxfam priority. I hope you saw it in our strategy. That redistribution and question around women's rights and those questions is core. Um, and I'm hearing nods coming from here. I'm that, that's the basics. Mara. Hi, I'm hand up in the back, otherwise known as Mara. Hi, David. <laughs> um, my name is Mara Bolas. I'm from Oxfam America. And thank you for having me here. I realize I'm a little bit of an interloper, so thank you very much. Um, so my question is whether or not I can understand from what's being presented that um, the implication that Oxfam sees and supports a rural economy that's more diverse and complex than a farm economy or an agricultural economy. Um, that's, that's sort of the question we had at the table was how prescriptive are we being about the activities as long as the activities are occurring in a market that's growing, that's prosperous. Fantastic. And there, I think there was one more From point there. It's okay. Yeah, in Bangladesh, actually, we're working in the rural uh, things, a very top and down level. 65% uh, people are landless, and among them, 25% are actually women. So, I mean, when we talk about the, about the value chain, I mean, how we can link up, because if you're targeting the private sector in a way, the private sector, we, are they going to be target or as an alliance to change, see the change in the life of the poor people or in the life of 65%. So that kind of connectivity or linkage, we, I mean, it's, it's a, it need more discussion, how we influence the market, power of the market and how we link with the social power relationship and gender power relationship. So that kind of discussion is more needed to make us very clear picture uh, in the whole market. It's not only the private sector part. Thank you. For the sake of time, we're going to have to draw a line under it. But just, just, to, just to really briefly wrap up. Different contexts, different solutions. You are going to have, in Bangladesh, we can see that, that urban urban rural nexus quite clearly and supportive policy and supportive government other places we are in a very neoliberal <coughs> traditional economic context and we're going to have to be more adversarial around in types of investment <laughs> national policy a, a slight went off my pack and it is the real challenge I see for our work, we're doing fantastic work. We have this question of inclusion, but n drawing, how can we use these fantastic examples you have, drawing more up to make more greater national change? How can we, we are theoretically modeling what is here. If we're not modeling it, there's a challenge to do more. But I think the real connection is from your work how you can leverage change at a higher level. And that's absolutely fundamental. Thirdly, women's rights. That is Oxfam's story. We have the three systems. We think about what goes on in the household. We've got some, we know that unless you get social change combined with market change, combined with the ecological, better protection and sustenance of, of natural resources, 
we won't get the economic development we want. And, our, and we are, Oxfam needs to sit centrally on the question around women and power and how those integrated policies work with the market-based policies these two gentlemen have really well put out. And thirdly, we're in this really complex area. Sometimes the private sector are going to be a real problem, and sometimes they're going to be part of the solution. But I think what I take from, from both presentations, options, 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 and informal markets, wholesale markets, we, we maybe need to rebalance slightly towards that area of work from uh, these bespoke value chain corporate relationship solutions that we've been seeing. But they are all part of the mix. They are all part of the mix.